Hello, this is Akram Jafar, and I'm going to present picture tests and practical anatomy of the abdomen, the posterior abdominal wall, part 4. You may use the video as a revision or as a self-assessment tool. For the purpose of self-assessment, pause the video and spend some time to read the question and come up with the answer. Then replay the video to confirm your answer by listening to the comments and explanations. Identify the peritoneal recess separating between A and B, and then name one digestive organ that lies directly against the anterior surface of B without being separated from it by peritoneum. This is a coronal section of the abdomen showing the right lobe of the liver and posterior inferior to it is the kidney, which is related to the visceral surface of the liver. Note that the left kidney is related, partly it is related to the spleen here on the left, and this is the stomach. Each kidney is obliquely set so that its upper pole is nearer to the midline than the lower pole. And although the section of the body is a coronal section, but the kidney itself is not actually cut in a longitudinal section. The reason for that is that the medial side of the kidney, the hilum of the kidney, it faces forward. And this is because of the protrusion of the lumbar spine. Thus, the transverse diameter of the kidney is foreshortened. And this can be detected in radiographs, which show the soft shadow of the kidney. Now, the kidney is a retroperitoneal structure. In fact, it is a primary retroperitoneal structure. Therefore, intraperitoneal structures, such as the liver, which are almost completely covered by peritoneum, are separated from the kidney by a layer of peritoneum. The reflection of this layer forms a pouch or a recess or a pocket, and this is called the hepatorenal recess or hepatorenal pouch or Morrison pouch. Excess intraperitoneal fluid or bleeding first accumulates in this pouch in the supine position. Now, medially, the anterior surface of the kidney is related to the duodenum, especially the second part of the duodenum, which is retroperitoneal. Most of the duodenum is retroperitoneal, and therefore, because it is retroperitoneal, it will be in direct contact with the kidney. The difference between the kidney and the duodenum is that the kidney is a primary retroperitoneal structure, while the duodenum is a secondary retroperitoneal structure. Also, Note that the anterior surface of the right kidney is not only related to the liver and duodenum, but it is also related to the transverse colon and coils of jejunum. And since both of these structures, the transverse colon and jejunum, they have mesentery, therefore they are intraperitoneal and they are not directly applied to the anterior surface of the kidney like the duodenum. Identify the zone of the kidney, name one distinguishing histological structure, and identify the structure, what is its lining epithelium. This is a longitudinal section of the kidney. You can see here that the structure B is the beginning of the drainage system of the kidney. You can see the renal papilla, the tip of the pyramid, is projecting into the calyceal system and is surrounded by a small cup. This is called the minor calyx, and it receives urine from the renal papilla. If you follow it distally, it will lead to a major calyx, and then two or three major calyces lead to a funnel-shaped distended area, the renal pelvis, that leads into the ureter. The lining epithelium here in the minor calyx, like in the major calyx, like in the pelvis and the ureter, is the urothelium, the transitional epithelium. The outer zone, A, is the cortex of the kidney, and it contains the renal corpuscles, which are responsible for filtration of the blood. Apart from the renal corpuscles, which are distinguishing histological features in this zone, there are also other parts of the nephron, like the proximal and distal convoluted tubules. Note that the loops of Henle and collecting ducts, which may be detected in the cortex and the renal columns, are the main feature of the pyramidal-shaped medulla. Identify the structures A and B. What is the origin of each? Now here you can see the suprarenal gland, right suprarenal, and the right kidney. Here is the inferior vena cava, which is more to the right. And you can see the ureter here over the psoas major muscle. Above is the diaphragm. 
The suprarenal gland, being an endocrine gland, has a profuse blood supply. So each suprarenal gland has three sources of arterial blood supply, uh, but it is drained by a single vein. The arteries are superior suprarenal, which is a branch of the inferior phrenic artery. Actually, we cannot see the inferior phrenic artery clearly in this specimen, but the inferior phrenic artery, as the name indicates, is located on the inferior surface of the diaphragm and arises immediately inferior to the aortic hiatus of the diaphragm. And apart from it, the branches that it gives to the diaphragm, it also supplies the suprarenal gland. Then we have the middle suprarenal artery, which is not shown here. You can see the vein, but uh, not the middle suprarenal artery. The middle suprarenal is a lateral branch of the abdominal aorta, just above the renal arteries. But the other artery that is shown here is this one, which is a branch of the renal artery, and this is the inferior suprarenal artery. Identify the structures one and two. Where do their contralateral homologues drain? This is a view of the posterior abdominal wall showing the kidneys especially the left kidney. You can see the structures at the hilum of the kidney. The most anterior structure is the vein. This is the left renal vein. Here's the right renal vein, and you can see that both right and left renal vein, they are tributaries of the inferior vena cava. But because the inferior vena cava is located a little bit to the right of the midline, then the left renal vein is longer than the right because it has to cross the midline in front of the aorta in order to reach the inferior vena cava. Also note that the left renal vein crosses in front of the aorta just inferior to the origin of the superior mesenteric artery. This is the superior mesenteric artery. Here's the celiac trunk, and this is the inferior mesenteric artery. These are the three anterior unpaired visceral branches of the aorta. The vein, the left renal vein, even the right renal vein, both of them, they are located anterior to the artery, and so they will conceal the renal artery, which is located behind it. And the most posterior structure at the hilum of the kidney is the renal pelvis, which give rise to the ureter. You can see the continuity of the ureter here, but you will not be able to see the renal pelvis because it is the most posterior. Now here it is clear that the left renal vein is not only draining the left kidney, but also drains the suprarenal gland. Look at the left suprarenal gland. It is crescentic in shape and is related to the upper pole and medial aspect of the left kidney. So this is the left suprarenal vein. And also here, it drains the left gonadal vein. You, you can follow the gonadal vein downwards in front of the lowest major muscle. You can see here that it's accompanied by the gonadal artery, which is a branch of the abdominal aorta. They descend downwards and they cross the ureter. Now these two veins, on the right side, they drain directly into the inferior vena cava. The right suprarenal vein is not clearly shown here, but the right gonadal vein, you can see here, these are the vessels, gonadal vessels, the artery and vein. If you follow the artery up, you will see that it is arising from the abdominal aorta, just opposite to the origin of the left gonadal artery. And the vein, if you follow it up, you will see that it's a tributary of the inferior vena cava. Now this is because the inferior vena cava is not laterally symmetrical and this is related to embryology. So embryologically speaking, the venous channels that correspond to the part of the inferior vena cava that receive the renal veins were bilateral, but then they disappear from the left side, leaving the left renal vein as a transverse anastomotic channel to the right. Same situation happens in the thorax. Remember that on the left side, we have the hemiazygous and accessory hemiazygous veins, and they have cross channels that cross the midline and drain into the azygous vein, which is only present on the right side. Tuberculosis of the lumbar spine may spread from bone into the sheath of an adjacent muscle, producing an abscess. A, identify the muscle A into whose sheath the abscess spreads, and when the pus travels downwards along the muscle, into which region does the pus bulge eventually? This is a coronal section of the abdomen. You can see the lumbar spine in the middle. You can see the psoas major muscle on either side. Note that it is located 
On the medial aspect of the posterior abdominal wall, in the gutter that fills between the body and the transverse processes of lumbar vertebrae. In life, the muscle is enclosed within a layer of fascia over its anterior surface, and uh, superiorly, the fascia forms a thickening, which is the medial arcuate ligament, one of the lumbar origins of the diaphragm. Naturally, the fascia in the upper part fuses with the fascia over quadratus lumborum muscle, and in the lower part, it fuses with the fascia over the iliacus muscle. So, this fascia, sous major fascia, extends downwards until it reaches the thigh toward the insertion of the iliopsoas muscle to the lesser trochanter of the femur. And therefore, any inflammatory collection resulting from like tuberculosis of the spine that penetrate through the fascia tend to be confined by it. And the pus will track down the length of the muscle to appear in the groin where the fascia is thinnest near the insertion of the muscle. Identify the structure A, what is its origin, and identify this structure, this nerve here, what is its root value. Structure A is obviously a blood vessel that is supplying the kidney, and it is connected, as you can see here, with the abdominal aorta, so it is the left renal artery. You can see that it is a lateral branch of the abdominal aorta, and it arises from the aorta just below the origin of the superior mesenteric artery. Here you can see the celiac trunk. This is the inferior uh, phrenic artery. You can see the superior suprarenal arising from the inferior phrenic. And this is the middle suprarenal artery arising directly from the abdominal aorta. And here is the inferior suprarenal artery arising from the renal artery itself. Going back to the renal artery, you can see that as the renal artery approaches the hilum of the kidney, it divides into several segmental branches to supply the parenchyma of the kidney. And here you can see that there is another artery, which is a common finding in many cadavers. This is an accessory renal artery. Such arteries, they originate from the lateral aspect of the abdominal aorta to enter the hilum of the kidney or any other part of the kidney. These abnormal renal arteries are due to persistence of the fetal vessels. Usually they are not accompanied by vein and they might pass unnoticed without any signs and symptoms, but, but sometimes they might produce symptoms because of compression of a nearby structure, for example, the ureter. Regarding section B, the nerve here is located in the posterior abdominal wall, superior to the iliac crest, and it is anterior to quadratus lumborum, and its proximal part is located behind the lower pole of the kidney. This is the iliohypogastric nerve. You can see that it is accompanied below its level by another nerve, which has the same root value of the iliohypogastric. This is the ilioinguinal nerve. And there is another nerve here, which is above, and this arises above L1, so it is uh, arises from T12. It is the subcostal nerve. So this is the subcostal just beneath the lower border of the 12th rib and then the iliohypogastric and the ilioinguinal nerves. Both iliohypogastric and ilioinguinal are derived from the lumbar plexus, which is the plexus of nerves that is formed within the substance of the psoas major muscle. And so you cannot see the plexus because it is within the muscle, but you can see the branches of the plexus. One of these branches should be anterior to the psoas major muscle, and there's another one medial to psoas major muscle, and many others are lateral to the psoas major. The ones that are above the iliac crest are the iliohypogastric and its collateral ilioinguinal nerves. Both of them are derived from L1. Sometimes you can see the division lateral to the psoas major, and sometimes they divide earlier when they are within the substance of the psoas major muscle. So sometimes you can see one nerve and then its collateral branch, or sometimes they divide early, and so you can see them as two separate nerves. Thank you.